So let me uh, begin by saying uh, buju and then away magani tok. Hello, my relatives. Miigwech kapija e koma ni beiga megong. Thank you for coming here to the uh, hotel Fort Gary. We bought a quick indigo quickly. Keep an ask. Is all we talking about one dish in the cars? My name is uh, Wab Kinu, and uh, we're very, very pleased to have so many people join us here tonight for the Duff Roblin dinner. This fundraising event in honor of the University of Winnipeg is actually sold out. And I think part of that is uh, a, a testimony uh, to the contribution that the man we are honoring here tonight has made to our country. I think it is clear to say that in Canada today, we are in an era of reconciliation, an era in which you know, the mainstream and indigenous peoples are asking, how do we build respectful relationships and what is the future of this country? going to look like. And so I'm mindful of the residential school survivors who in demanding justice for themselves also created an opportunity for this country. So I always like to acknowledge the uh, residential school survivors such as my late father, Tabasana Kwati Bun, uh, as well as uh, many others in attendance uh, with us here tonight. But following that call for justice, you know, the country responded. And part of the response included the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. And if you are to read the executive summary of the final report of the TRC, not only will you see a remarkable roadmap for where this country might go in the future, it's also a, a remarkable insight into the, the perspicacity the sagacity, and the wisdom of one Murray Sinclair. So why don't we all show our uh, guest of honor a remarkable, remarkable man, a round of applause. And so we have to be honest, you know, it is uh, a, a dark era in Canadian history that delivered us to this point. It is the fact that residential schools were the law of the land for over 100 years. And the effects of that system are still here with us today. Sometimes, you know, we don't need to travel very far from the Hotel Fort Gary to see some of those impacts. But even in a family like mine, you know, we're, you know, for the most part, we're all professional, educated, successful. There, there are still impacts. You know, I've had the, the chance to reflect on that this past year in uh, writing a book, uh, The Reason You Walk. And as I was writing the book, I, I recognized that the, the same way that my father was made to feel by the priests and nuns, uh, he brought that home with him. His whole idea of how an adult should relate to a child was informed by that. And so how do you think he raised me? It wasn't as severe, but still some of the same dynamics were at uh, play. But as I sat and wrote the book, I recognized in the way that I'm now raising my own sons, too much of those personality defects too much of the proclivity towards anger, too much of the impatience. And so even in a family where people are uh, successful by the standards of the mainstream, we still see some of that intergenerational impact of the residential schools. But what Murray has done is to take up that challenge and to frame it in such a way that this country might better achieve the truest iteration of itself through. And that's a remarkable, remarkable thing. You know, If we are to respond fully to the 94 calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, report, not only will we do justice to the survivors of residential schools, but we will be doing uh, justice to our country, to the vision that each and every one of us have in our hearts that this is a land where everyone is free to reach their full potential and where we come together to pursue mutual benefit and shared prosperity. And so I'm very excited and I'm very humbled to see all of you here tonight uh, making at least uh, some steps towards achieving that vision of reconciliation. And so I'd ask that you all uh, 
once again give a round of applause to everybody who's made this evening possible. And of course, we still have um, some ways to go. The Day Scholars have uh, their claims outstanding, as do the uh, Métis students of residential schools, you know. But uh, the TRC report did, I think, make an attempt to bring them in to the fold and also to deal with some of the legacy there. So with that in mind, I'd invite you at uh, some point during the evening to check out the uh, National Center for Truth and Reconciliation display over there. And this will be the living archive of the TRC. It will be housed at the University of uh, Manitoba. And so you can begin to acquaint yourself with some of the materials that will be preserved there for posterity so that every generation of uh, Canadian from here on in will know the truth of where we've been together and uh, gain a better understanding for where we might go together. So we like to... Um, we would like tonight to also be an opportunity to put reconciliation into action, to uh, foster some dialogue here uh, at tonight's event. And so many of you are seated at uh, what we're calling conversation tables. And so you have been matched up with people from uh, different walks of life, different industries, uh, so that you can begin to learn a bit about one another and start to uh, ask the question, what does reconciliation mean to us? And of course, we want you to take the uh, conversation online. So please use the hashtag, hashtag Duff Dinner, hashtag TRC2015, hashtag To Reconcile, hashtag NCTR, hashtag My Reconciliation Includes. If you don't know what any of what I just said means, fear not. We're also using good old fashioned uh, pen and paper. Not to mention the fact that uh, good old-fashioned uh, conversation at the table is more than welcome. So you'll see these uh, little placards on uh, all the tables around the room here. And uh, there's some questions here, you know, that may uh, guide the conversation on reconciliation. You know, asking questions like, how do you define reconciliation? Uh, what can you do to advance reconciliation? And so on. So if you are technologically inclined, then please uh, tweet the answer to some of those questions. If you prefer face-to-face -face conversation, then please engage in that dialogue with those uh, other people at your table. And uh, hopefully, uh, we'll start that uh, productive, meaningful conversation about what reconciliation means. Incidentally, uh, I was going to ask you, have you ever noticed that uh, nobody under the age of 35 ever has their cell phone uh, turned on in public? It's always, it's always on mute. It's always on mute. I'm just pointing that out now. So if we hear cell phones going off during uh, Murray Sinclair's speech, well, guess what your birth date is. <laughs> and I hazard a guess that it'll be before 1980. No. No, I'm just... Uh, all that to say, you know, you know, you guys know the drill, cell phones off and uh, pagers. We, you've still got a pager, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so. <laughs> but uh, all that uh, in, uh, you know, just to have a little fun with you guys. So at this time, we are going to invite, um, oh, one more thing. Because the legacy of residential schools is so challenging, because the NCTR display does deal with some uh, graphic material, and because some of the conversations can get heavy, there is actually uh, counseling and cultural supports uh, on site here. So it's actually upstairs on the, the mezzanine level in the uh, Selkirk room. There's an area that you can go smudge, or there's an area that you can go debrief. So if you need to access those uh, services, uh, please feel free to do so. So with that in mind, I'd like to invite um, a good friend of the University of Winnipeg, the very Reverend uh, Dr. Stan McKay, to come deliver our opening invocation. Stan is, of course, a member of the Fisher River Cree Nation, residential school survivor, and a minister. Stan. I'm mindful this night as we gather that there are people in Paris and in other parts of Europe and other parts of the world who are living 
with fear and anger, who are mourning and suffering. So I invite us just to take a moment to contemplate our good fortune and our blessings in this place. I would invite those who are able to stand, please. We gather this night as people who are truly blessed. We have come to feast, we have come to learn, and we come expressing gratitude to the Creator for the initiatives of the U of W in shaping this evening. For all of you who have come here, be part of this significant and momentous evening of reconciliation. We come with thanksgiving as we acknowledge that we are gathered on Treaty 1 territory, which is also the homeland of the Métis Nation. Kanatanaski, Kanatanipi. The earth and this land are sacred. The water is sacred. We gather in Manitoba, Manitoba, the resting place of the Creator. So we give thanks this night for the path that is set before us, the path to reconciliation guided by love and respect, a path that is now marked by recommendations from the TRC. We give thanks for the wisdom and the vision that has come from the commissioners and the staff of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And especially this night, we give thanks to the Creator for Justice Murray Sinclair, who at great cost, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, has guided this process, the quest for truth and healing. We give thanks this night for the support he has received from his family, from the medicine people and the ceremonial elders who have journeyed with him. So this night we ask the Creator to bless us in an inclusive way, in the four directions Bless us, Creator, be so any minan, so any minan, so any minan, so any minan. Ego se. All right, miigwech, and thank you, uh, Dr. Stan McKay. So all of uh, the people that you see here tonight, all the uh, organization that uh, went uh, into tonight's uh, events was uh, spearheaded by uh, one man, and uh, we're going to get a chance to hear... Uh, from him uh, to right now, actually. So uh, I'm going to invite up the uh, vice chairman of the, the University of Winnipeg Foundation Board of Directors, also the chair of the University of Winnipeg Foundation uh, Dinner Commi Committee, uh, Bob Kosminski, to come and uh, bring us greetings. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as uh, I've been introduced, my name is Bob Kosminski, and if I can steal a Praise from my good friend Doug Stevens. Wow, uh, there's quite a crowd, and uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out tonight. This is the ninth annual Duff Roblin Award dinner we're having, and this is the first one that's been completely sold out. And we have over 450 people here, which is over a hundred more than we've ever had. So thank you very much. As all of you know. Dinners like this don't come together very easily. And while I may get a lot of the credit, I want you to know that I had an incredible dinner committee. My honorary co-chairs, Sherry Walsh and Jamie Wilson, were incredible. Marty Larkin and her team from Boom Done Next are fabulous in terms of organization. 
And of course, the staff that we have, in particular Sydney at the University of Winnipeg Foundation, did an incredible job. So please, thank all of you and on behalf of all of you. All of the Duff Robman scholars thank each and every one of you. The proceeds of this dinner will be directed to the University of Winnipeg's Opportunity Fund, part to the Truth and Reconciliation Scholarship for Children of Survivors of the, re of the Residential Schools, and as well to the Duff Robin Fund itself. I'm pleased to tell you that we have $1,150,000 in that fund, and as a result, it generates a significant amount of income every year to allow children or students to come to university and get a post-secondary education that they might not otherwise be able to get. As well, I can't help but think, as Rob has also said, that the huge turnout we have tonight speaks to the quality of the recipient and as well the respect for the recipient. And that As we know, truth is so important, and now all of Canada knows the truth about the residential schools. I met with uh, Justice Sinclair, and I was absolutely taken with the charisma of this man and the commitment that he's shown to what has happened across this country and what the sacrifices that he's made in terms of being able to put this report together. Your attendance tonight suggests to you, just, just to me, that you agree as to the incredible character of this individual. When I, when I met with him, two phrases that he said he constantly heard across the country, this is important to me, and what can I do about it? And you'll notice, as, as Rob has already said, that we've got some things on the table that we want to precipitate a conversation. We want you to talk with those of you who are at the table, and as well to start that process. It's extremely important that we become respectful of all Canadians, but in particular our Aboriginal and Métis friends. We have to implement many of the, and if not all of the, recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation, and of course that can't be done without the support of all Canadians, not just our parliamentarians. Communications is a two-way street, and you'll find out later tonight, I'm sure, that our recipient is a master communicator. I can't help but feel that another master communicator, the Honorable Duff Roblin, is looking down upon this gathering, very proud of the legacy that he, we've established in his name. I'm sure he'd be very proud of your attendance here tonight and of the recipient's leadership as head of the Truth and Reconciliation process. Education is the key to all human development, which is one of the key messages that the Honorable Duff Roblin stressed to me and Dr. Axworthy when we went to meet with him to talk about the creation of this award. I'm repeating myself for those of you that have been dinners, uh, dinners in the past, but he said, oh God, Bob, he says, I'm so pleased that somebody's actually gonna talk about something other than my ditch. <laughs> because he really felt that his contribution to education was as important, if not more important, than that incredible floodway that's protected this city for so many years. Once again, I stress to you that all Canadians should be entitled to a post-secondary education, and thanks to you, much of your support will establish and be able to fund that principle. As you can see, we've got an incredible auction table up here with some phenomenal items. Now that you've opened up your heart in terms of this process, I'm going to ask you to open up your wallet. We will close the auction relatively early, we're counting on all of you to provide the support that we need to give the students the opportunity, again through the community learning initiatives, the Opportunity Fund, the Duff Robin Awards, and the Truth and Reconciliation Scholarships. Once again, thank you for your attendance, and please remember, besides opening up your hearts, open up your wallets, and make sure that, at the very least, you empty it. <laughs> thank you very much. As you can see, I'm the fundraiser in the crowd. We talked about uh, Bob's uh, message beforehand, and he said, I, I want to strike a very subtle tone in front, of, <laughs> in front of this crowd here tonight. So I want to acknowledge uh, the um, honored guests in, in attendance, and this is quite a, quite a, a list of uh, people who've come out here tonight. So if uh, you could join me in uh, welcoming all these people, maybe uh, 
if you each want to stand up as you're acknowledged, and then we could uh, show you our appreciation then. I think uh, I may be bro breaking protocol here, but maybe we could honor um, Duff Roblin's daughter first, uh, Jennifer Roblin. Yeah, there we go. Jennifer's a huge ally of the University of Winnipeg, and earlier today she actually donated a, another $5,000 to the Wichiwaganuk Learning Center, which is the site uh, where we respond to the epidemic of uh, violence against women through the uh, Sacred Seven program, where we teach uh, culture and language to Indigenous kids, where we teach uh, math to uh, young people of all ages through the summer months, and we do a lot of work to help uh, prepare uh, inner city youth for a post-secondary education. But we're able to do it thanks to the generosity of people like Jennifer. So, once again. We have the Honorable Carolyn Bennett here, the Minister of Indigenous and Northern Affairs. The Honorable Greg Selinger, Premier of Manitoba. The Honorable Kevin Chief, Minister of Jobs and Economy. <laughs> U of W alum. The Honorable Carrie Irvin Ross, Minister of Healthy Living and the MLA for Fort Richmond. <laughs> the Honorable Eric Robinson, Minister of Aboriginal and Northern Affairs. We have uh, Cliff Graydon, MLA for Emerson. We also have uh, the leaders of uh, many indigenous governments here tonight. Uh, the president of the Manitoba Métis Federation, Dr. David Chartrand. From the uh, Manitoba Kuwait Noe Ogima. Kuwait Noe Ogimakanak. We have Grand Chief Sheila North Wilson. Oh, yeah. We have the Assembly of First Nations uh, Regional Chief for Manitoba, uh, Kevin Hart. Uh, I heard Kevin Hart's going to be at the MTS Center later this week, so maybe he's. Uh, from uh, the Long Plain First Nation, uh, Chief Dennis Meaches. I know Dennis is here. Very good. From Swan Lake First Nation, Chief uh, Francine Meaches. And Chief Cindy Spence of uh, the Paguas First Nation. There, Cindy. We also want to acknowledge uh, the following uh, traditional knowledge keepers in attendance tonight. Uh, Elder Harry Bone. There's Harry. Elder May Louise Campbell. Over here somewhere. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, El and then uh, big shout out to everybody from the University of Winnipeg especially uh, Dr. Annette Trimby, the President and Vice Chancellor. <laughs> Bob Silver, the Chancellor of the University of Winnipeg. <laughs> Brian Daly, the President and CEO of the University of Winnipeg <laughs> Foundation. Dr. H. Sanford Riley, Chair of the University of Winnipeg Foundation Board of Directors. Dr. Anita Olson Harper. Oh, yes. Past President and Vice Chancellor of the U of W, Dr. Lloyd Axworthy. and former National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Ovid Mercury. We'd also like to shout out the past uh, honorees of the Duff Roblin Dinner, 
including uh, Charlie Coffey. Gail Asper. Uh, Jan Belanger of Great West Life. And Edward Kennedy of the Northwest Company. All right, how are you guys doing? We're about halfway through the list. No. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So big round of applause for all the uh, representatives of government and industry who are here with us tonight. We also want to thank uh, so many of our sponsors here, uh, Tetram Capital Management, RBC Royal Bank, The Lodge at Little Duck, Hub International Horizon Insurance, Hill Sokolsky Walsh Olson LLP, CIBC Wood Gundy, Mehmet Investments, Duboff Edwards Haight and Schachter Law Corporation, Manshield Construction, Grant Thornton LLP, Number 10 Architectural Group, the Manitoba Government, Darcy and Deacon, MTS, the Northwest Company, Century 21 Real Estate, Bird Construction, RBC Dominion Securities, Charlie Coffee, Order of Canada, Winnipeg Free Press, and Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries. So please show them some love. And a big uh, thank you to the sponsors of the Conversation Tables, Wawanisa Insurance, Omnitrax Canada, Thompson Dorfman Sweatman, LLP, The Great West Life Assurance, James Richardson and Sons Limited, True North Sports and Entertainment, the Asper Foundation, the Gail Asper Family Foundation. I think that was Gail on both, <laughs> both tries there. <laughs> That's great. The uh, Fort Gary Hotel Spa and Conference Center, the Johnston Group, Inc., Charlie Coffey, <laughs> Sandy Riley, Out and About Travel Incorporated. So once again, Big thanks to all of our sponsors. Please show them some appreciation. So at this time, we're going to hear from the person that uh, our new Prime Minister has tasked with overseeing the project of reconciliation in this country. No small uh, order of business there. So please uh, join me in welcoming, me in welcoming to the stage the Honorable Carolyn Bennett, Minister of Indigenous and Northern Affairs. Wow, is right. Look at all of you, and uh, this is uh, truly exciting. And uh, good evening, especially the students, the faculty, and all the distinguished guests, and the, the elders, and the, the leaders of the Indigenous communities, uh, Miigwech, Kriyanomik, Marci. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bob, uh, for putting your team together and having such an amazing, amazing outcome today and uh, and to Dr. McKay for the blessing uh, and particularly for the moment of silence for for what is happening overseas and uh, a, a very special thanks to Wob uh, in that uh, the way that uh, that you have uh, always conducted these events in a good way it uh, it's therapeutic for all of us uh, and it is part of the reconciliation that uh, I'm supposed to be able to figure out how to do. So um, I, uh, I it, it was, knowing that you were emceeing it tonight, I was thinking that how many Christmases everybody I knew got uh, a copy of Eighth Fire um, and how important that was in the journey of reconciliation. And I wanted to tell you that one of my friends who helped a lot on the during the past election, sent me an email this week saying that she is giving a copy of Eighth Fire to all of her friends and on the on the on her Christmas list this year. And so I think that this is how it begins and begets uh, the kind of reconciliation that your way amazing way of speaking um, with humor and with uh, with intense passion and knowledge. Uh, has, has really helped us uh, as a country go forward. Uh, it is uh, obviously 
a huge honor to be here uh, on this auspicious occasion. As, uh, as, as you know, um, one of the problems I have is that people think I'm a Justice Sinclair groupie. Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, and it, uh, it, uh, I'm really here just to thank you for writing the roadmap for my job and that it's, uh, it's a little bit easier when you know exactly what to do and it's, it is um, step by step by step and as I was able to say today in Thunder Bay um, at the education conference um, that, that it shouldn't be lost in, to anybody in this room that you've put children first in all of the calls to action, and I, I thank you for that, and I think it, it helps me in my work um, to know that the children have to come first, and thank you very much. It me fait plaisir d'être parmi vous ce soir pour cet important événement, soulignant le cheminement exceptionnel de Monsieur le Juge Sinclair. It's, um, it is a, uh, Amazing to have watched over these six years uh, someone who has worked tirelessly all his life for Indigenous rights, but also here for Winnipeg, for the province, but for the whole country. And for that, we all thank you. Uh, in the work that I think all of you had the opportunity to see parts of, um, it was this amazing balance um, that Justice Sinclair was able to achieve between the revealing of old wounds um, but providing the opportunity of healing that, that happened right at that time. You could see the witnesses um, as they disclosed their story, feel the support and the healing journey to begin right away. There was no gap in between that and we think, thank you for the way that you structured that and we are we are very grateful and and it's interesting um, this week in speaking to one of the the family members of the as we embark on the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls commission how much she thanked you for your intervention um, at the round table and she said you know justice sinclair really explained to us what commissions can and can't do and and I we will need your strong voice as we go forward to make sure that we don't let those families down again because that that we have set an expectation that 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 won't happen so we uh, we if you think you're done you're not done yet <laughs> it is uh, it was um, this painstaking and heart-wrenching work that uh, that it is, is, it told a story that, that all Canadians and the rest of the world need to understand. And I think it, it so often as, as sometimes uh, we felt that Canadians weren't following this closely enough and then all of a sudden there'd be all of the articles in Montreal or all the people showing up in Vancouver that this was a, this Canadians were paying attention and we, we know that they heard your words about this dark chapter in Canadian history, but also about what meaningful reconciliation really means. And it said, Me reconciliation that will not come until we live up to our past promises and ensure the equality of opportunity necessary to create a prosperous shared future. And so it is hugely important um, as we are here tonight to understand that this is why you're all here not only to hear from Justice Sinclair, but the way that the Opportunities Fund and the way that, that Dr. Axworthy and, and the people who have organized this fund are making sure that that opportunity is coming by, by waiving the tuition for, for children in care, by, by the summer camps that make kids think that they might just be able to do this. And so I think that, that it is such a fitting tribute tonight for all of you that that have been here that, that will now be paying close attention to the kind of outcomes that will happen from the students here at the University of Winnipeg. And uh, I have to 
do a small shout out to my friend Marilyn McFedrin, who who uh, one day called me just boasting about the four one-hour um, segments that Justice Sinclair had done for her students that can be used and used and used uh, because, again, it was so poignant and so important to those students to hear directly from you, even when you can't be there. But you are everywhere, so um, it is, uh, it is uh, amazing. As you know, the Prime Minister Trudeau has said that reconciliation is truly the unfinished business of Confederation. And, uh, and I think that that's something we're all coming to understand as we look towards the, the celebrating the 150th year of, of this country, that we need to get some reconciliation done between now and July 1st, 2017, if we're going to be able to hold our heads up um, and go forward in a good way. <laughs> On the morning um, that we went to Rideau Hall for the end, for the, 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 the final ceremony in the, in the calls to action, um, we had breakfast with some of the churches and uh, it was Elder Ray Jones from the Gitson tribe who told me, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to do this very well, but in Gitsin language, shed dim ama gau dingu mel, which means this canoe must be uprighted. And I think that's what we all feel. And as a, as a paddler, I know what it takes to sometimes get your canoe uprighted in, 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 in tough waters. And it is a, this is, and then you need help from everybody getting the water out of the thing. And so I, I, I think that we really do are taking seriously about this canoe that's got to get uprighted because we are really only at the truth and each one of us in this room needs to feel deputized about the reconciliation piece. That you can't leave here tonight without answering the questions and trying to find on Twitter how you're going to answer, get, fit in all the hashtags, as well as any sort of message. Um, we think it's crucial and central to all we do is, is this deputizing of reconciliation that has to go out in waves. I am so grateful, um, as the Minister of Reconciliation, that, that the Justice Sinclair and the Commissioners have uh, provided this amazing blueprint for my job, and I and I look forward to December 15th when he, you will be able to to deliver the final report to the Prime Minister uh, with all of the the leadership of, of of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis there. I uh, it is uh, it is um, the way forward, and I I guess it it is that. that why, why this matters to me? Uh, what can I do? These questions that we're asked tonight are questions that we have to be asking ourselves and our friends. We have to, I know in this job that I make lots of mistakes and I know that my friends correct me. And that's what you will all here in this room have to do. When people say dumb stuff, um, that stereotypes and all of that, you correct them because Justice Sinclair expects you to. And, and we've all been here tonight understanding that the torch is being passed to us to get this right. So it is, a, it is about remembering the past and a window to the future that we walk through that stained glass window every time we walk into the House of Commons about what the apology meant and, and, and that amazing long, long word of Giniagan e Meniagwig. Are you gonna help me with that later? Say again. That is about looking ahead. <laughs> so I think I'm going to stop now. Uh, it is about, uh, about our heartfelt thanks from everybody in this room, but every single Canadian for what Justice Stinkler has done. And uh, congratulations. Thank you. Merci. Miigwech. Kuriyama. Merci. Thank you so much, Minister Bennett. You know, you know, many people in our community have been uh, commenting on the change of the name of the federal ministry, you know, from INAC and then ANSI, and then now it's become INA, I guess, Indigenous and Northern Affairs. But my Dakota friends were telling me that those three letters, INA, it means mom. 
in the Dakota language. Ina means mom. So it's a sure sign that the paternalistic relationship of the past is over. There you go. <laughs> You use that one when you go to Sioux Valley. <laughs> uh, she did refer to one thing that I wanted to follow up on, and that is the uh, tuition waiver program. One of the great intergenerational impacts uh, that we see here in Manitoba is the overrepresentation of Indigenous kids in the child welfare system. And the University of Winnipeg, under, first under the leadership of Lloyd Axworthy, but under the continued leadership of uh, Dr. Annette Trimby, has found fit to respond by starting a tuition waiver program where we waive uh, the cost of tuition for kids who are aging out of, young people who are aging out of the child welfare system. And so we have a few uh, students who are here tonight. So hopefully I'm not uh, overstepping any boundaries, but uh, Natasha and Raina, do you want to just stand up and give everyone a, a wave? These are some of the people who are... And I'll have you know that they're both A students. So people often are concerned that when we open the doors to the academy that it comes at the expense of excellence. They're living proof that absolutely not. You open the doors to new, new people uh, to come into the academy, they bring in their smarts, their work ethic, and they prove uh, their worth every single day at the University of Winnipeg. So with that, I'd like to uh, welcome up uh, the Premier of Manitoba uh, to, to bring his greetings to us, the Honorable Greg Selinger. What number am I on the speaking list, Bob? <laughs> I think we've got to get to the point here. Uh, there's a lot of recommendations, uh, Murray. But the really important point, I think, in reconciliation is the tone we set. And I want to commend you for the tone you've set and the way you conducted the TRC for the whole country. It wasn't a tone, Beth, let's give him a round of applause for that. It wasn't a tone of recrimination or guilt. It was a tone of kindness and respect for each other. And out of that comes that feeling of love that when you respect and are kind to each other, you can grow. And that sets the foundation for the relationship of reconciliation that we need to pursue in this country. And it doesn't start with the commission. It started well before that. I remember when you were first appointed to the bench and then came out and visited programs like the inner city social work and education programs and told the stories of what happened to you and your family and the peoples and the foundation of the province and the role the chiefs played with Louis Riel and building a, a society of inclusion in this province, which for many decades was ignored after that, but it started right. So that tone is something that gives us guidance for the future. And what I would like to say is, is that I think we started that process of reconciliation. You never used to hear a speech where people started with the notion of, here we are on Treaty 1 territory in the homeland of the Métis. That's standard almost now to hear that. And that's a good beginning to every discussion that we have. It's a good beginning. <laughs> the University of Winnipeg, and I want to commend the co-chairs for the dinner tonight, uh, Sherry Walsh and uh, Jamie Wilson, and of course Bob, and for having this event uh, in the honor of Duff Roblin. But when you have these events and you see the university doing tuition waivers, or you visit the summer program where young people are getting an education and all the support they need to succeed, and you see it happening in a, a downtown university that has a real commitment to the neighborhoods that they dwell in, and the recplex, now called, I think, the axplex, uh, if I get it right, but a, a, concept, a concept that is available not just for the people of the university, but the people of the community around it. That sets a tone of respect for the surroundings that we dwell, the territory that we're on, and the people that are around us, and why we want them to be a part of that institutional fabric. That's a good sign. When I talked to, uh, I talked to Debbie uh, Young later, earlier on tonight, about a, an agreement she's forging with post-secondary institutions to bring everybody together around an agenda of reconciliation. That's going on right now as we speak in the community. When I see my colleague, uh, Eric Robinson, and all the work he's done on missing and murder indigenous women and girls since before he was in politics, that means we're providing leadership in Manitoba on that issue. And it's being picked up by many other leaders in this room. Uh, some of whom were just recently elected, pressing forward on the notion of having this inquiry. 
and the inquiry speaking to the issues of not only misogyny and racism and classism and poverty and all of those things coming together when we think of that issue of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. And the Museum of Human Rights that's just over here that Gail Asper uh, took forward from her father's inspiration. But just around the corner, the memorial, the uh, art piece of sculpture that we have to missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, which reminds us of the distance we have to go. I think in Manitoba, we can be an example for the country of reconciliation. Every little act, every little day, every little gesture of kindness, every desire to understand a little better, that journey, the book that Wob's written, give it out at Christmas time, get people to think about it, get people to discuss it, have these conversations. That will all build a foundation that will make a difference for many generations to come. And I, when I see uh, Justice Murray Sinclair and I showed up on the steps with Syrian refugees and there was another Sinclair there speaking about, as an indigenous person, why we need to be open and welcoming of Muslims in our community and refugees. That tells me that future generations can take what we've started now to a higher level. Thank you very much and have a great evening. Before we have the uh, food service, we do want to invite up um, the, the Dr. Reverend uh, Terry Hidichuk to say grace. So we're going into grace. If everyone wants to please pay attention for a minute. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. For those who, um, for those whom, uh, for whom prayer is important, it's time to pray. For those who, for whom meditation and reflection are important, this is your opportunity. Creator, God of many names, out of many traditions, out of chaos we have order, out of darkness there is light, out of the earth food that nourishes us, out of the waters our thirst is quenched. For all this we are thankful. We are thankful for the gift of this food, the earth that produced it, the hands that prepared it. In a world where there is plenty, we remember those in want. In a world where many are satisfied, we remember those who go hungry. With our bodies nourished and our hearts filled with joy and with love, may we go from this place with a thirst for justice and for compassion, kept ever mindful of the needs of others. Amen. All right, so I want to acknowledge another dignitary who's here with us tonight, uh, Rana Bukhari, the leader of the Manitoba Liberal Party. If you show her some appreciation. All right, all of uh, tonight's festivities is, uh, in addition to being geared towards reconciliation, is about uh, raising money to support uh, students at the University of Winnipeg. And in particular, the uh, Duff Roblin dinner goes to uh, support students in the uh, Two of the graduate programs we have at U of W, actually. The uh, Master's in Development Practice Program with a specialty in Indigenous Development and the Master's of uh, Arts in Indigenous Governance. So uh, we'd like to acknowledge that there are past Duff Roblin uh, Fellowship recipients in the house here tonight, so please show them uh, some appreciation. So at this time, we would like to uh, get into uh, the presentation of the Duff Roblin Award. So if I could have everyone's attention and uh, if we could all uh, devote our full attention to the next person that we're inviting up to the stage. He is actually uh, a colleague over at the University of Manitoba who is the, uh, the, the head of the newly formed National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Once again, that's the organization whose archive is on display over there. And uh, who are the uh, entity which will take care of the uh, residential school archive established by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. So at this time, I'd like to invite up uh, Rai Moran, who is going to introduce this year's award recipient. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having me up to the stage here uh, on this um, very important and very wonderful night because we are not just celebrating a man, we are celebrating a great man and truly a great Canadian that has not only given us the opportunity to sit in this room together, but the opportunity to reflect 
on our national history and some of our greatest national shames. So we've already heard a lot about Justice Sinclair, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my relationship with Justice Sinclair and how I came to meet Justice Sinclair once upon a time, uh, really what amounted to about six years ago. Uh, so at that point in time, I was uh, living out in Victoria, BC, and the commission was getting off the ground again. Because, of course, we'll remember that there was a bit of a false start to that first commission, and Justice Sinclair and the other two commissioners were tasked with really resurrecting this thing from the ashes, uh, finding a way forward for this commission that meant so much to so many and had so many hopes instilled upon it. So the commission started uh, trying to hire and staff up, and next thing you know, I was getting a call and said, well, we're, we're looking to hire some of the directors for the commission. Well, at that point in time, when somebody like Justice Sinclair gives you a call, you recognize that this is an incredibly important initiative, an incredibly important undertaking that is happening in the country. And why is that? Well, Justice Sinclair, even before he came to the commission, had achieved so much and had accomplished so much, both with the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry, uh, incredible other activities here, the first Aboriginal jurist in the province of Manitoba. So walking into Manitoba in early January, I was given the opportunity to meet Justice Sinclair for the first time, which, let me tell you, is quite the experience. Because you sit down in this room, and there's this little known fact about judges, that judges are actually trained in the art of stoic faces and never giving you much response or feedback in terms of what you're saying. So I guess it could be called judge face. And uh, we've got Justice Sinclair is sitting at the end of this table and the other two commissioners and uh, they start grilling you in the interview. And they're grilling you hard. And at no point in time do you ever get any sort of nod or reflection or anything like that. It's judge face the entire time. But judge face was actually uh, a... <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, you know, this was something that uh, we ended up growing through and learning how to uh, conduct this work at the Commission. And one of the things that I can say, personally, from first-hand experience, is that at the start of the Commission's work, Justice Sinclair and the other Commissioners were faced with an incredible task. And this was the task of fulfilling the obligations in Schedule N of the Settlement Agreement. And this was not a rule book. This was not a clear path. This was a set of things that needed to be accomplished in a very short period of time under intense public scrutiny and with the hopes and dreams of many imbued upon it. And at the beginning of the Commission's work, Justice Sinclair was tasked with not only amassing this collection of documents, but bringing us all together in this room at present. I have had the deep honor and the privilege of listening to Justice Sinclair speak to rooms like this for the last six years. And each time he speaks, there is reconciliation that happens. Each time he speaks, there is learning and new information passed to audiences. And Canadians have been made aware of this incredible and sorrowful history that we have in this country. Justice Sinclair is so deeply deservant of this award and so deeply deservant of all of your accolades that are being instilled upon him tonight because without a doubt, this commission would not have happened without him. And without a doubt, it was his leadership and his vision that led to the assembly of people that you see on that back page of your program. That back page of the program that showed thousands upon thousands of people gathered in the national capital, walking together in a show of unity, in a show of togetherness, in a show of national recognition that this journey that we are on is a collective one, it's one that must continue, one that is ongoing, and one that does indeed mean that there's much work ahead of us. So ladies and gentlemen, let me personally give my sincere regards to Justice Sinclair, a man that I have had the deep fortune of working with for the last six years, a man that will continue to inspire us for years to come in this country, a man whose words will undoubtedly resonate not just for the next five or ten years, but through the generations, because this is a multi-generational effort of reconciliation that we are on in this country. Please join me in welcoming Justice Sinclair to the stage.
We're also going to invite up uh, Dr. Annette Trimby to uh, make the presentation of the award, and then we'll hear the acceptance speech from uh, Justice Sinclair. All right, I'm not going to touch this damn mic, OK? <laughs> I think that's what happened last time was I lowered it, and now I think I'll be more successful if I try to grow into it. It'll <laughs> probably make more sense in the final analysis. Uh, so w earlier on, I was, I was trying to say to you uh, that um, I'm not used to evenings like this. I'm not used to events like this where the the focus of attention is on me, and um, accolades are thrown my way, mainly because so much of our time as the commission has been spent traveling with uh, the team to go and meet with survivors, and the survivors have always been the focus of our work, and uh, asking them to, to come forward and talk to us has always been a very important part of what I have done. And I always like to uh, acknowledge them in everything that I do, even in smaller gatherings, uh, wherever I might be. So I would like to ask if those who are here, who are survivors, would stand up, and also the intergenerational survivors and the Aboriginal students who are here, would you all stand up so we can acknowledge you? <clears throat> Thank you. It is, after all, about them. It's not about me. It's about them. Because after the conversation here is going to end this evening, I want you to turn your attention to them. I want you to turn your attention to the fact that that population of people, and your children as well, need our help to be able to come to terms with this history that we have written about in our report. I had the, um, the honor to receive a, an honorary degree at Carleton University over the weekend. And uh, in my address to the uh, graduates at that convocation, I said to them that reconciliation is not as complicated as we think. Reconciliation is really about relationships. And it boils down to this. I want to be your friend. And I want you to be mine. I want you to have my back. I want you to help me when I need help. And I want you to be able to call upon me when you need mine. I want this nation to feel that we are friends together as we go forward. But I want you to recognize that we have some healing together to do first. And that healing is because of what occurred in the residential schools. But it's also because of what occurred in the public schools of this country for many generations as well. And many people don't recognize that it wasn't just the abuse that led to the problems that we see that Aboriginal survivors of residential school are having to cope with. About half of the children who went to residential schools subject were subjected to some form of abuse, either physical or sexual. But the other half also suffered because they bore witness to that. They were present when the abuse was occurring. They heard those stories. And they also bore witness to the discipline that was meted out to some of the students who tried to do something about it, even those who just spoke their language. So even those who did not sub, were not subject to physical or sexual abuse in the schools were always living in fear that it might happen to them. 
And that fear does something to you. And it did something to them. In the stories of the survivors that we listened to over the course of the years that we were working on our report, we know that many survivors talk about that emotional and spiritual fear that they carried. My grandmother went to a residential school and she also sent her children to residential school. And one time I asked her why did she not allow us to keep speaking the language. She could speak Cree and Ojibwe and some Oji Cree, also French and English, but she would only allow us to speak English once I started school. And I asked her, why do we not know our own culture? Why did you not ensure that we had that? Why did you not help us to learn the language? And she said to me, I wanted to save your life. I wanted to save your life because it was going to cause you damage. It was going to cause you hurt. You would be attacked if you spoke that language and used it. But more importantly, unsaid by her was this. She truly believed that if we spoke the language, if we practiced our culture, that we would end up in hell, that we would end up in eternal damnation. And she did not want that for us. That's what she had been taught in the schools. So our ancestors, our grandparents, our parents who went to those schools lived with that kind of fear as well. That their children, if we were to try to recover that for ourselves, would run the risk of going to that place that they had been told no one should ever go to. And the intergenerational survivors, the children and the grandchildren of survivors now are coming to terms with that in the best way that they can. Many have talked about the anger they have towards their parents for not teaching them the language, for not giving them the culture, for not helping them to answer those four questions that I've always talked about. Where do I come from being the first? Where am I going? Why am I here? And who am I? perhaps more accurately, who do I want to be? All of which the education system is intended to give us answers for. But the education system in the residential schools did not answer those questions for those children. And even for those Aboriginal children such as me, who went to public school and who excelled at public school, we did not get our answers from that school either because in the public schools, they also taught that Aboriginal people were inferior, Aboriginal people were savages, were heathens, were people who stood in the way of the growth of this nation, were people who prevented settlers, those kind European settlers who came to this land from settling this land and farming it and taking advantage of the benefits of the richness of the earth that Aboriginal people were wasting this place and that Aboriginal people were lucky that Europeans came here and saved them from dying out. I remember that story too. Never mind the fact that we had been here for tens of thousands of years, thank you very much, without any Europeans helping us. But they taught that to us in school. And so they did damage to the children, the Aboriginal children, in the public schools as well. But they also damaged those of you who are not Aboriginal because by teaching you that Aboriginal people were inferior and heathens and savages and were irrelevant to the history of this country, the message that you received was that we were. And the other message that you received was that your European ancestors were superior to the Aboriginal people they encountered. And that has led to a great divide between us. That has led to a great divide in this country that is part of what we need you know, to overcome in order to reconcile. 
It's not about coming to terms with the government. It's not about reconciling with the churches. One of the survivors said, I cannot reconcile with the government. I cannot reconcile with the church. He said, it's like asking me to reconcile with a car that runs me over. I can't do that. I need to find the driver. And I need to participate in a process to reconcile with the driver. But all of the drivers of that car are no longer with us. So there's nobody for me to reconcile with there. But for survivors, the most important part of their reconciliation need is to reconcile with their children and their families. And in my presentation to intergenerational survivors, I've always said to them, as I say to you tonight, those of you who are intergenerational, if you want to contribute to reconciliation, then love your ancestors, love your parents, learn to forgive them because they need that in order to be able to leave this world in peace. And those of you who are here who have gone to public schools with me and with others and are wondering what is it that you can do to contribute to reconciliation, I give you this challenge. Read the recommendations. Find one, just one, that touches you and work with it. Make it happen. In your business, in your profession, in your career, whatever it is, make it happen. Because we have taken our calls to action very seriously and we have thought them through and they all have a purpose. And ultimately, if they are all carried through, they will contribute to a better relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous people in this country. But more importantly, they will contribute to the healing of this nation. They will contribute to the healing of the indigenous population, but they will also contribute to the healing of the non-indigenous population as well. Because this country has a cloak of shame that still hang, hangs over it. And that cloak of shame needs to be put aside, needs to be dropped at some point. But you can't just throw it away. It'll keep jumping back on you unless you deal with it in a proper way. And the way to deal with it properly is to address those things that need to result in a change in behavior. This is like any relationship that you can think of where we have come out of a situation of abuse between us. Non-indigenous people, non-indigenous governments have abused Aboriginal people for a long period of time. They have taken advantage of the trust, the friendship that was offered, and have not returned trust and friendship in the same way. And now, if you want our trust again, you have to earn it. And the way to earn it is to be my friend and let me be yours, to have my back, to let our children grow up and talk to each other in a better way. So we need to have a system in which we educate our children properly about the history of this country so that they will understand what this country has done to its indigenous population. But they will also understand what this country has done about that and they can then move forward with pride. Indigenous people as well, before we can move to that relationship of mutual respect, also need to have an opportunity to engage in a process of self-respect, of gaining our pride back. Because we have lots to be proud of. We have heroes, we have beliefs, we have teachings, we have creation stories. We know what's going to happen to us after we die. We know why this earth is the way that it is. We know how to fix it. And we need to talk about those things. But we have all of those things. The creator put us on this earth, in this place, and gave us everything that we need to know. That's one of our fundamental teachings. All tribes believe that gave us everything that we needed to know. And now we need an opportunity
to exercise that knowledge in partnership with all of the rest of Canada. And someday, I hope, my grandchildren and your grandchildren will be able to go to school together, will be able to talk with, to, and about each other in a relationship that is more respectful, in a way that they will have each other's back, in a way that they will be able to stand up together and be able to talk about this history today as the moment that we started to make things better. And I know that we can do that. I believe in all of you, and I believe in this country. But we have to get to make it happen. We are responsible for what we do. I am honored to receive this award for contributing to the importance of education and the understanding of education in this province and in this country. Residential schools were all about education. And education is what caused and has caused the most damage in our relationship. But education is the key to reconciliation going forward. And Duff Roblin would be proud to know that. Be proud to know that he has contributed to that and that we are going to help him and the TRC make it happen. Thank you very much. Abachimi Gwech Murray. Thank you very much, Murray. Kisonga te'e. You have a very strong heart. And for that, we are very appreciative. And his granddaughter and my sons actually go to school together. And they are going to school in a country where they are learning about the past of residential schools and treaties and Aboriginal rights and Aboriginal culture. So there is hope. And the process is beginning. But thank you so much for reminding us of the distance yet to travel, but of also uh, the contribution you have made to charting that course forward. Miigwech. And now to offer closing remarks on behalf of the University of Winnipeg, I'd like to invite up uh, a woman who is making an immense contribution to the project of reconciliation in our city, in uh, her continuing efforts to indigenize the academy, but also to ensure that the University of Winnipeg experience is one which uh, celebrates everybody in this part of the world, Winnie Bing Manitowabe. So with that, I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Annette Trimby, the President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Winnipeg, to give her remarks. I'm not going to fiddle with the microphone, <laughs> but it's like at the top of my head, isn't it? But, uh, and I'm wearing high heels. It, it's an incredible honor for me to be here with everybody tonight to honor Justice Murray Sinclair. I grew up in the city of Winnipeg, and I really like to announce to people when I wrote my name that I was Annette Coulomb living in Winnipeg in Manitoba, North America, uh, and I go, I go all the way to the galaxies, and I really thought I was living at the center of the universe. But there were some things about the Winnipeg of my day in the 60s that I'm really happy to learn have changed. So when you asked people to stand up who were survivors or who were intergenerational survivors, I didn't stand, but I think now maybe I should have because there were a lot of things that I didn't get to learn. There were a lot of things that we hid in my family. And one of the truths that uh, I was taught in school in Winnipeg, in grade three, four, five, somewhere around there, I, I remember coming home one day and my dad would ask us every day what we learned. And I came home one day incredibly excited about Winnipeg's water supply and the remarkable engineering feat to get water from Shoal Lake. But nobody talked about what that meant to the people living on Shoal Lake. So now I come to Winnipeg many years later and I'm so pleased to hear 
that we want to make it right. And Premier, I did hear in the throne speech something about a road, so. <laughs> so tonight's conversation, I, I hope you found incredibly rich. I hope you met a new friend. I hope you talked about some things that you're a little uncomfortable about. And that's really the lasting legacy of the evening. But I know, Bob, uh, you've done us proud and we've raised a lot of money tonight. And that money uh, will go to many good causes because you've met some of our students and they are incredible. And they will be future leaders. So the conversation matters. The fundraising matters. Uh, this will go on and on. I learned a little bit about Murray at my table. Um, okay. <laughs> Murray was a young man, 16 years old, 17 years old, in first year education. He was a jock. He wanted to be a teacher. He was sent to a school. The students were listening to him. He was going to be evaluated the next day. Murray found a way to get those students to behave and it involved a little bit of negotiation. So Murray paid himself out of a problem and got a very positive evaluation. He tells his story much better than I do. But he also negotiated his way out of a robbery, and that's, I'm just whetting your appetite. You have to ask, <laughs> you have to ask him what's, what that is all about. But on a more serious note, I couldn't be prouder to live in the city of Winnipeg because I do believe that Winnipeg is at the epicenter of an Indigenous comeback we will be the place that leads in the unfinished business of the Confederation. So Murray, I want to tell you on behalf of everybody in the room, we want to be your friend. We have been deputized. The conversation will continue. And my final note will be to share because I've had several prompts from several people. But if you like tonight's conversation, there's more to come. And the University of Winnipeg, the University of Manitoba, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission are hosting a Pathways to Reconciliation event this June in Winnipeg, and we want to talk about some real progress. So, so thank you very much for coming tonight, for engaging, for allowing me to speak. I want to thank Bob, I want to thank James, I want to thank Sherry, I want to thank Wob, what a fabulous MC, incredible talent here in Winnipeg. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much, Mick Witch, and good night. <laughs>